This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Dole Food Company, the world's leading producer and distributor of fresh fruits and vegetables. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to welcome members of our armed forces who are joining us over the internet today, as well as first-time listeners on new affiliate stations in New Mexico, Iowa, New Hampshire, Mississippi, Nevada, Massachusetts, Florida, and New York. Thank you for making us part of your Newsweek. In just a moment, former governor of Minnesota and the man who many expected to be Mitt Romney's vice presidential running mate, Mr. Tim Pawlenty, will be joining the program to talk about a subject the 2016 presidential candidates have not yet addressed. And that is the fact that one third of the U.S. population comes of retirement age within the next 10 years. And the latest reports indicate most Americans have less than $10,000 of savings to fall back on. Actually, when you dig a little deeper, these days the only people who have the means to retire seem to be government employees and the well-to-do. And we're going to hear more about that in today's program. But before Mr. Palenti joins us, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little about his background. Timothy James Palenti was born in St. Paul, Minnesota, and earned his undergraduate and law degrees from the University of Minnesota. While in school, Palenti interned in the office of Senator David Durenberger, where he got his first insider's look into the world of politics. Upon receiving his law degree, he worked as a labor attorney until he was invited to join a software services company in Minneapolis, where he was appointed also to the city's planning commission. Then in 1992, Palenti was elected to the Minnesota House of Representatives, where he served five terms and as the House Majority Leader. In 2002, Palenti threw his hat in the ring for governor of Minnesota. He emerged victorious and served as governor until 2011. It's important to note that Palenti inherited a $4.3 billion deficit when he became governor. And by the time he entered his second term, he had eliminated over $2.7 billion of that deficit. During this time, Palenti also acted as chair of the National Governors Association. Though Palenti has explored the idea of running for president of the United States, he chose to put his experience and talent to work behind the scenes, acting as co-chair of McCain and Romney's campaigns. Palenti eventually returned to the private sector as president of the Financial Services Roundtable. And I would be remiss if I did not mention that Mr. Palenti is a best-selling author. His book titled The Courage to Stand tells the story of his journey from a young boy in a small meatpacking town to the highest office in Minnesota. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report former governor of Minnesota, Mr. Tim Palenti. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Palenti. It's a delight to be with you and be back with you on the Costa Report, Rebecca. Thank you. Well, it's wonderful to have you back. As I mentioned earlier, you know, one third of the United States comes of retirement age in the next 10 years. And recent surveys indicate retirees have less than $10,000 in savings and almost 60 percent do not have any retirement plan at all. So we are facing a near-term crisis in our country, yet we don't hear the presidential candidates talking much about how this is going to affect the economy. So I wanted to ask you to talk us through this situation because you've spent a lot of time looking at both private sector and government sector retirement benefits, and you discovered there was a pretty big discrepancy. Is that right? Boy, we sure have, Rebecca. And well, thank you for teeing up an important topic that is not getting enough attention, either in the presidential debate or more broadly. And so I think everybody knows Social Security exists, but Social Security is not uh, necessarily sustainable in its current form. So the government needs to act to reform and stabilize and improve Social Security. That hopefully will get done, even though people, politicians keep talking about it, it doesn't actually happen. But beyond that, People also have to take more responsibility for their own retirement future. Life expectancies are growing rapidly. People are going to live a lot longer. And for many people, uh, Social Security is going to not provide enough resources for what they hope to achieve and the level of of, uh, living that they want to have in retirement. So here's one example of the kind of low-hanging fruit that's out there that, as as a nation, we should be talking about. Congress, many years ago, authorized employers, companies, to automatically enroll into their workplace savings plans, retirement plans 
uh, and also automatically escalate their employees in those plans. Of course, employees would have the option to opt out if they don't like it. But if you have employers who automatically put people in instead of having to do the paperwork and opt in, it changes the participation rate in the workforce, and it changes it remarkably and substantially, especially for women, younger workers, and workers who are minority or have diverse backgrounds. And it's not just changes it a little. It changes it a lot. So that's the kind of idea, that's an example of the kind of thing that we should all be pushing. Employers should be doing this. It doesn't cost them, you know, this automatic enrollment doesn't cost them anything or much. Employees should be pushing for it. And companies should be trying to, you know, to their peer companies saying, if you want to be a best of class employer, if you want to be one of those companies that says it treats your employees really well, then do this. And so we're trying to do that through a campaign called Save 10. And if people are interested, you can just Google Save 10 and it'll come up on on the uh, Internet search. Well, now, how is that different from employers offering employees a 401, uh, 401k plan, for example? Yeah, so that's a great question. And the difference is employers may offer a 401k or an employment-based savings plan like a 401k, but they don't do what's called automatically enroll employees in the plan. So you could choose to be in, you could choose to be out, but you've got to you know, take the steps if you're an employee to get in. And we're saying through this suggestion, employers should automatically enroll employees in those kinds of plans, even if uh, they do at a modest level. And that changes the participation rate, the employees, the number and percentage of people who participate in the plan. And if you do, that goes way up. Employees don't get mad if you put them in there automatically, and it changes the savings rate. Exactly. And I can't agree with you more. I mean, it's kind of like not wanting to have your phone uh, number and your name in the phone book. You know, they automatically print it unless you actually get a hold of them, uh, wait, uh, wait on the line. And, and then you actually have to pay money to have them not put it, in the, put it in the phone book. So, you know, who wants to go through that trouble? So most of us just live with having uh, uh, our, our phone numbers uh, and our names in public. Um, it yeah. turns out the, that the, 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 yeah. the other thing, Rebecca, there's about a third of the companies, uh, 25 to a third percent or to a third of the companies that don't offer employment based savings plans or 401ks or similar programs. So we want to find low-cost, easy, non-bureaucratic, non-regulatory, non-expensive ways to encourage those employers to offer plans for their employees, too. And and, uh, there's a whole discussion that needs to take place about that as well. Well, absolutely, because small businesses are so overburdened these days, they can't afford to be thinking about retirement. Uh, and But it turns out that the Bureau of Labor reports that very few enrollees make their full contribution, even to 401k accounts, and most have less than two years' income in those 401k accounts. So that's not looking good either. No, in fact, if you look at the statistics, and that may be off a little bit about this, so give me a little grace because I'm doing it from memory, but something like 25% of adult Americans have less than $1,000 saved for their retirement, and another very substantial percentage uh, has less than than $60,000 total, and then that percentage is like you know, over half of the adult population has less than 60000 Now, 60000 is a substantial sum. But when you think about what it's going to take to live you know, 10, 20, 30 or more years in retirement, trying to do that on even $60,000 of savings is just very, very difficult. And Social Security, while very helpful and appreciated, you know, only provides a very modest safety net for – and it's, not, it's going to be very disappointing to a lot of people if that's all they have. Well, I'll tell you a really uh, scary statistic. Uh, Cambridge geneticist Aubrey Dubray has – has uh, gone public and said that the first person who will live to be 1,000 has already been born. Yeah, there are people working (laughs) on technology, some Silicon Valley types who uh, believe they're going to want to live forever, at least for another 100 years. That's right. And when you think about the resources it's going to take to sustain someone 1,000 years, my goodness. You know, uh, and we we, we just we don't even have a plan for that. Um, We have to take our first break. But but stay where you are. We'll be right back with more from Tim Pawlenty. You're listening to the Costa Report. (music) 
If you're wondering what to do with all that data you're creating, do I have an offer for you? Tableau is drag-and-drop software that people of any skill level can use to analyze and turn data into something actionable. That's right. I said actionable. And isn't that what all that data is for? With Tableau, you can connect to any data in virtually any format and visualize it on the fly. Databases, spreadsheets, even big data sources are instantly combined into usable charts, graphs, reports, and dashboards. People can analyze data and drag and drop at 10 times the speed of a traditional business intelligence system. But the most impressive thing about Tableau is that anyone can use it. And just to prove the point, you can get a free 14-day trial from Tableau just by mentioning you heard this ad. But do it now, because this offer won't last. For your free 14-day trial, visit Tableau at tableau.com slash Costa. That's tableau.com slash Costa. Tableau Software. What's your data trying to tell you? I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli of Caraccioli Cellars, recent winners of the best sparkling wine in the U.S. in the Champagne and Sparkling Wine World Championship. Congratulations, Scott. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks for having me. So what is it about your Brut Cuvée that beat all the other competitors around the world? We really focus on creating an expression of the Santa Lucia Highlands and doing it the right way. And when you control the process from the beginning to the end and you have talent like Michelle and top-tier grapes, they really shine through. This was a worldwide competition. It was definitely a humbling experience. We were in a room with producers that have been making wine for over 100, 200 years and was a huge honor to have Tom Stevenson give us the best U.S. Sparkling Wine Award. We fared really well overall. We had three wines win best of class, which was great. Visit the Caraccioli Tasting Room on Dolores Street in Carmel by the Sea, or find us online at caracciolicellars.com, or reach us by phone, 831-622-7722. Hello, I'm Paul, a student at Hillsdale College. Here is my professor, Dr. Larry Arn, on the separation of church and state. America's founders believed in the separation of church and state, in that the country was not to have an official religion or an official sect. But that did not mean that government was to be hostile to religion, or even indifferent to religion, as many today argue. In fact, America's founding document, the Declaration of Independence, includes both a reference to God as the author of the laws of nature, and a confident assertion that human beings are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Far from being hostile or indifferent to religion, America's founders understood the theology of the Declaration to be an essential part of the education of citizens. This Constitution Minute was brought to you by Hillsdale College. To join the national conversation on the Constitution, go to constitutionminute.org. Michael Olson here, Watsonville Airport, something brand new and exciting, and I have the person that's responsible, and your name is? Ella King. Ella. Ella's at the airport. Yeah, that's right. You got it right. What are you going to do to please the palates of the Monterey Bay Area with Ella's at the airport? Uh, Well, we are working with mostly local, organic, sustainable seafoods, grass-fed meats. So you start with that, and from there we build a beautiful meal, be it lunch, dinner, or weekend brunch. I think that from there, we've got you covered. Ella's at the airport also has a great outdoor seating area where you can watch the airplanes come and go. And we also feature a full bar. Ella's at the airport, 100 Aviation Way in Watsonville. Call 831-728-3282 for reservations. That's 728-3282. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is former governor of Minnesota, Mr. Tim Pawlenty. And before the break, you were saying that an automatic retirement deduction system by private employers would cause a much larger number of employees to participate in a retirement plan. So it sounds like you're saying that providing for retirement requires the cooperation of the private sector uh, along with the government. Is that right? No question, Rebecca. That's a great summary, and it really is going to take a number of steps, but two of them are for those employers, those companies that already offer a 401k-style savings plan, automatically enroll your employees in there, and it'll do what you just described, which is increase the number of people participating 
and the percentage of your workforce participating and the amount that they save, and that will help. And then two is for those companies that don't offer a plan like that, we want to work with government and private sector solutions to make it easier and, and less burdensome and less costly for small employers to be able to offer a plan for their employees. Because if you work at a place and you don't have one of these plans, you're at a big disadvantage. And uh, some companies are small. They can't afford it. it. The paperwork is too tough. The, bur- you know, the regulatory risks are too high. And we need to simplify the landscape, the system, so that more small employers feel comfortable offering that kind of plan. Absolutely. Now, I think that uh, everyone knows the biggest challenge with the deficit, uh, which is, you know, climbing to what, 20 trillion next year by the time uh, we elect the next president. Well, the biggest challenge is going to be these entitlement commitments uh, like Social Security. And I mentioned earlier that you managed to take a $4.3 billion deficit in Minnesota and reduce that down to 2.7 um, by the time, by your second term. So uh, you've had a success in tackling an overwhelming debt. So give us some idea. What What's the next president going to do to get that $20 trillion debt under control without throwing our aging population under the bus? Well, a, a couple of things. One is that it's important to have principles, and it's important to stick to them. And I think one of the principles we should set as a country and set for our leaders is you can't spend more than you take in. Your listeners don't get to forever or for very long, spend more than they take in, and we should expect the same for our government. At the state level, it's easier because 49 of the 50 states have a constitutional requirement that you have a balanced budget. So the constitution of our states forces the the politicians to balance the budget, and a tool like that at the federal level, with exceptions for war and crisis and emergency, I think would be very helpful because I don't know that the politicians are capable, really, of living within their means over a sustained period of time. I wish they could, but history shows, at least recently, that they haven't been very good at it. Two is, if you look at the federal budget, all the federal outlays, and look at it as a pie chart, a circular pie chart, and you add up Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and interest on the national debt, those expenditures are already over the halfway line on the pie chart. And if you add defense, it's over the three-quarter line and growing so rapidly that in the not-too-distant future, it'll take up almost the whole pie chart. So in order to tackle spending, you, and if you want anything left for you know health research and colleges and the environment and roads and bridges and the like, you have to tackle those big things that I just mentioned. And it, it's not so much that it's mysterious as to what needs to be done, but the political will hasn't existed to actually do them. And so it's going to take, sadly, I think more pressure or a crisis in one of the one or more of those programs before Congress has the backbone to actually tackle it. Now we've got a lot of um, uh, Washington outsiders campaigning this year more than ever uh, for uh, the presidency, and they seem to have a good track record in business of dealing with these issues. But how is that different from dealing with a federal or a state budget? I mean, I, you know, the, people keep making comparisons of what you did in business as though uh, you, you can do the same thing in it, when you're in a public office in government. But you've got laws that restrict you. So I, 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 I was hoping that you've worked on both sides of the aisle there. You've worked in private business. You've worked also as a governor. Uh, how is it different? Well, in government, if you're the majority leader or the president or governor, it's a little different if you're in the executive position. But, you know, there you've got a in the U.S. House of Representatives, which is 435 people, uh, and in the Senate, 100 people. So you got 535 people who are essentially your board of directors. So if you're the president or the governor and you have a state legislature like that and you say, you know, we're going to do X, um, you know, they're, your 535-person board of directors says, well, maybe we'll do X, maybe we won't. Um, <laughs> in, in the private sector, you certainly have shareholders and a board of directors, but it's much more hierarchical. You know, if you run a company, you have the confidence of your board, usually, you know, five to 15 people. Yes. Uh, and the backing of your shareholders. If you say we're going to do X, the organization, you know, says, OK. And the CEO said we're going to do X. We're doing X. Everybody get in line and we're going to go do it. We're going to do it with a deadline. We're going to do it with crisp execution and we're going to be accountable for the results. And if we don't, you know, we're going to get fired or something bad's going to happen. In government, it's much more horizontal. You know, it's the founders uh, said, look, we're going to have checks and balances. We're not going to have somebody be able to run roughshod over the system. So each branch is going to have equal power, and they've got to use persuasion, 
kind of soft power, if you will, to persuade the other branches to go along with it. So it's a slower, more distributed, more uh, check and balance uh, featured uh, system. And it's just not as easy to snap your fingers and get something done. Right. I mean, it's it's a much more nuanced system. Yeah. And you got to go, you got to cajole, you know, you got to go, if you're governor, you can have a press conference, you can announce an initiative, but then you got to go sell it. You got to go convince Congress who are sort of your equal partners that they have either an interest in getting it done or it's a good idea. It's not just you know, issuing a command and expecting that it'll get done. Now, of the candidates that are running on the Republican and Democratic side, do you see anybody that you think has a good plan for reducing the deficit and has the will to do it along with the ability to sell it? Nobody's really articulated a specific plan, Rebecca, but I'll just shoot your, to your listeners straight. Look, if you want to tell the truth about what has to happen you have to reform those entitlement programs uh, that I mentioned earlier. You got to reduce the debt and the deficit, and and you have to say, look, for anybody who's close to retirement, we're not going to change anything. We're not going to threaten anybody who's either on or getting close to any of these programs. But if you're say under 40, um, we're going to be making some changes in the future. But we're telling you now what they are, so you can plan accordingly. You got 20 years, 30 years to think about it. We're going to have to gently raise the uh, eligibility age for some of these programs. By the way, we're going to have to means test it so the rich people aren't going to get quite as much as some other people, either in terms of you know, annual increases or otherwise. And we're probably going to have to you know, make some other changes in the program. But it's not hard. You, know, you can fix Social Security real easily by just gently raising the retirement age over time or, or means testing part of the program so rich people don't get all the same benefits as everybody else. And you go a long ways towards fixing it. And again, I wouldn't do it for anybody on the program or close to the program. And and what people don't realize is in current law, if Social Security goes into a point of insolvency, mm-hmm. benefits under current law get cut automatically 25%. Uh, so, so that's already baked into the current. So is that the likely outcome? No. I mean, I if nobody wants to touch it, that's what will happen, yeah. right? I think I think it'll be short of that because nobody would want to tolerate a 25 percent cut in benefits. And so they'll do something eventually, but it's going to take more pressure, frankly, more of a crisis environment because they just keep kicking the can down the road. because They don't want to tackle it because uh, they don't have to yet. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. And they get punished, and they get punished for talking about it. <laughs> they, they, people get beat up over this. Isn't that the truth? But they're not the first yeah. people to be punished for t- speaking the truth. Uh, we have yeah. to take another short break. When we come back, we're going to talk about uh, an, another issue which has been noticeably absent from the presidential debates, and, the, and that's the topic of cybersecurity. So stay tuned. You're listening to the Costa Report. Biodiversity is the very fabric of our lives. It is everything around us, all of nature. But human impact is diminishing biodiversity at an alarming rate. And because of that, the intricate web of biodiversity is unraveling in ways we don't fully understand, and our world is becoming less resilient. That's why we are biodiversity advocates. We're the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation. Guided by the greatest living naturalist, E.O. Wilson, we champion research and education that expands our understanding of biodiversity and informs worldwide conservation efforts. The E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation is building a movement of environmental stewards like you who share our sense of responsibility for the living world that is our home. Join us in our quest to protect biodiversity, the fabric of our lives. Visit eowilsonfoundation.org. Jungle Plant brings the lush outdoors into your home or office with plants that always look their best. Jungle Plant owner Dale Crable provides quality indoor foliage and a nurturing plant service throughout Santa Cruz and Monterey counties. Jungle Plant is mobile and comes right to you. Services include plant rental, a guaranteed weekly maintenance program, vacation care, and plants for gift arrangements. Call to schedule a free consultation. 831-462-5806 831-462-5806 or visit jungleplant.com. People do not like going to the dentist unless they're going to this dentist. Hello folks, Michael Olson here with Dr. Guy Peabody. Well, doctor, you work with a lot of people who haven't been to the dentist for a long, long time. There's got to be a little fear there when they show up in your office. Yeah, it's funny you ask that. People are worried 
when they first come to see us if they haven't been to the dentist in a long time because they're afraid they're going to get berated. And uh, I chuckle at that because we're here to help people. We assure them that we have today and the future, and we're just going to take good care of them, and everything's going to be fine. The most important thing we can do for them is listen to them. We want to find out what their concerns are. We want to find out who they are as people. We want to know if they're apprehensive about dental care or not. We want to know what their goals are. My job is to mainly find out how I can make them happy, and I can't do that unless I know what's going on inside. Call Dr. Guy Peabody for our consultation today and wake up to a great smile tomorrow. 831-457-0343 or visit drpeabody.com. Is your internet connection slow? Etheric Networks can help you. Etheric Networks is the Bay Area's locally owned alternative to DSL satellite and cable. We do a few things to make our service better. We have a great reputation and our staff is committed to providing a great user experience. We listen to our customers and listen to our staff. We pay living wages. Our staff are local Bay Area engineers and professionals. We provide flexibility and personalized service. Being in Silicon Valley, we have direct contact with the networking software and hardware companies and can bring new technologies to market before the cable and phone companies. We operate a tower-based fixed wireless network as well as a fiber optic backbone network that rings the bay. The combination creates an ultra reliable high capacity network that you ought to try. KSCO Business Special. Business service up to 10 megabits per second symmetric for as little as $299 a month with a $399 installation fee. Etheric Networks. Call 650-399-4200. Etheric.net. They've come back to KOMY for another exciting season of hockey. Here's Marta with speed on the left. Makes the move on Petrovic in front. Back hit shot. He scores! A spectacular goal by Patrick Marta as he blasted his way in. Afterburners flying. The Sharks are up 3-1 and Patrick Marta has his fourth of the year. Don't miss the next exciting San Jose Sharks game on KOMY. AM 1340. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and if you're just joining us, my guest today is the former governor of Minnesota and also co-chaired the presidential campaigns of McCain and Romney, Mr. Tim Pawlenty. So switching gears for just a moment, there are a number of Americans who feel that cyber terrorism represents a much greater threat than physical terrorist acts. And I know that you were a proponent of the Cybersecurity Information Act. Can you tell us a little about what that act is and why it was so important? Sure. The the short version, Rebecca, is the the act that just passed allows legal safe harbor if companies share cyber information in good faith, not about personal information, but about cyber threat information. So if your company is hacked or you have reason to believe somebody's trying to hack your company or your systems, and you need some help or you want to warn other companies about it or you want to let the government know so they can do a criminal investigation or maybe even a terrorism investigation, um, you know, you want to be able to give up that information and not be worried about getting sued. So, for example, if you're a bank and you get hacked or attempted to hack and you turn it over to the government, you know, is somebody else going to be able to do a Freedom of Information Act and see what you turned over? Are they going to be able to see your systems that may be you know, uh, competitive or com- proprietary from a competitive standpoint? You know, are the trial lawyers going to get a hold of that and sue you for negligent maintaining your systems? Are your regulators going to look at it and say, aha, thanks for, for giving this to us. Now we're going to fine and sanction you for keeping you know, negligent systems. So the idea is if you share threat information in good faith, uh, and it's not personal information, it's threat information, then you'll get some legal protection from getting sued and fined and sanctioned if you're doing it with the spirit of trying to warn other people and to try to uh, avoid further damage. So it's like an amnesty program. Partial amnesty. You know, you don't get automatic amnesty. You can't say, you know, we were we were negligent and, you know, did bad things and we're coughing up some information and somehow get blanket protection or amnesty. It's just amnesty for turning over the information, not for, you know, any underlying causes or negligence. Yeah, you know, I was trying to explain this to somebody, and I drew the analogy of the uh, the FAA offering an amnesty program for pilots who came forward and reported near misses. You know, that was yeah. always going to be something that left them vulnerable to being sued, and yet the FAA needed to accumulate this information so that they could institute 
uh, safety measures so that other pilots wouldn't uh, repeat the same mistakes. Exactly. And so they offered an amnesty program, and it worked beautifully. Pilots couldn't wait to report errors because uh, it, it, it helped protect them from any further damage. And if somebody can monitor that pattern of these you know, intrusions or in errors in the case of medicine or pilots, you know, over time you can see patterns and then make corrections. And you want to be able to make sure that that information is good and it's made available in a timely fashion. The other thing, just real quickly, it does is, you know, if China triangulates or decides to focus on one company or, or Russia or Iran or North Korea or some of these criminal gangs from the former East, you know, Soviet bloc or Eastern Europe, you know, that's not going to end well for the company. It's not a fair fight to say, it's you know a fill in the blank company versus China. We have to have a Team America approach to this because otherwise any one company is going to not have the time and the resources and the money to fight off you know attempted cyber hack by other nations or nation states or international criminal gangs. And that's where a lot of it's coming from. Mm-hmm. And so this allows a sharing and a team approach to some of these issues that empowers and brings more resources forward than any one uh, company could do by itself. Right. It's it's basically aggregating all the information known so that it, which makes it easier to identify who the criminals are. Right. And how to defend against it or what the mm-hmm. patterns are. Like if somebody has a, a near miss at a at a company and they say, look, this is what they tried to do to us. You guys should know about this. So if they try to do it to you, here's how you defend against it. You know, that's valuable information to share with other companies. Yeah. Now, along those lines, I'd like to get your take on a really interesting twist when it comes to hackers. A day after the Paris uh, terrorist attacks, the hacking group Anonymous announced that they plan to unleash a series of debilitating cyber attacks on ISIS. And as we all know, Anonymous is comprised of some of the most skilled hackers in the world. So I guess I'm wondering if we want to be in such a hurry to go after these rogue hackers and whether we should maybe be turning our focus to state-sponsored hacking, uh, such as those that were launched by Chinese and Russian governments. I'm not trying to say let the bad guys off, but if they're going to help us with ISIS. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that Anonymous uh, is going after ISIS. You know, believe it or not, ISIS has a radio show. They have a magazine. They have lots of social media platforms. And so... To the extent Anonymous or anyone else can get after them and cause harm and damage to ISIS, great. Um, that being said, if you look at cyber attacks over time and worldwide, it's pretty clear that this has shifted from college kids in basements trying to hack into the DOD and the like. And we got a lot of either nation states or nation state sponsored or nation state enabled uh, groups who are behind most of this. And, and frankly, uh, it's been publicly reported that a lot of it is coming out of China, a lot of it's coming out of Russia, Iran, North Korea, and the like. And sometimes it's nation states, sometimes it's criminal, but it's a lot more sophisticated than it used to be. And it's there's some scenarios, Rebecca, that are just very, very concerning, and they present almost an existential threat to some of the most critical infrastructure in our country. I mean, imagine, I don't want to scare people, but you know, imagine a scenario where they shut off the electrical grid not for you know, a couple of days, but for a few months, you know, point of sale terminals don't work at grocery stores, refrigeration systems don't work, heating systems don't work, instant cash machines don't work, you know, there's no lights in uh, the Gas street. pumps You're, don't work, g- you can't drive. G- gas pumps don't work, the sales terminals theirs don't work, and by the way, the natural gas lines, you know, are pressurized using sometimes electricity on the other end. So, and that's just one scenario. Mm -hmm. Uh, So this is really serious stuff, and it it presents an existential threat to our country. Um, We're really good at it, uh, as other countries are, but we have got to stay on top of this and ahead of it. And it's, it's probably one of the most challenging issues of our time. But from everything that I read, we're taking a defensive posture. We don't really have an offensive plan, do we? Well, under uh, U.S. law, the only entity that is authorized to hack back, attack back, counterpunch, if you will, is the U.S. government. If you try to do that as a private citizen or a private entity, uh, you know, you could find yourself in legal trouble. So we depend on them to provide the deterrence and the hack back. And they, uh, if they are doing it, they don't tell us about it. So, you know, you know about the Sony picture situation where it was attributed to North Korea uh, without explanation, you know, the Internet in North Korea kind of went out for a day not too long after the president said we're going to go after North Korea at a time and place of our choosing. You know, it was never acknowledged that the U.S. you know, caused the Internet in North Korea to go off for a day. 
but uh, it happened. So you might wonder, how did that happen? <laughs> but you know, nobody's saying uh, we did Funny that. coincidence. Right, right. <laughs> now, you've suggested that Congress uh, should create a strong electronic security uh, requirement, which businesses which handle sensitive material would have to comply with. But to many businesses, that sounds like even more government regulation coming down the pike. Is this something that government needs to legislate or provide guidelines, or is this something that businesses and consumers just have to assess their risk and assume responsibility for? Well, it's a think of it as a pipeline or a chain that's only as strong as its weakest section or link. Mm-hmm. So the financial services sector and some others have been at this a long time under regulation, and I would say you know the financial service sector is as advanced as anybody in this space, but we're linked to a bunch of other sectors that haven't put the same amount of investment and time and expertise into it, and we're vulnerable because we're connected, let's say, to some – companies through their payment systems uh, who, who've got old equipment or not very advanced approaches to this. So the consequences are so severe, I don't think you can just say, at least for those things that are critical infrastructure like electricity, payments, right. um, you know, water, uh, stuff like that, you know, we, we just think we'll leave it to whoever's running that stuff, and we hope that they do well as they try to figure out what China's up to or Russia's up to, and we hope they buy the right equipment and make the right investments and buy the right software and hire the right people, and, you know, and their standards are high. I think it's more dangerous than that, and it's a national security issue. So I think we have to have minimum standards, at least for the sectors that are you know, critical. That, yeah, that represent critical infrastructure, the financial system also. Now, we have to take our yeah. final break, but we'll be right back after these important messages from today's sponsors. You're listening to the Costa Report. Do you love creating salads as much as you enjoy eating them? Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Dole inspires fresh and wholesome dishes for any meal with their wide selection of salad blends and all-natural salad kits. From the mild and tender texture of sweet butter lettuce to the crunch of classic romaine sprinkled with colorful shredded carrots and red cabbage, Dole has over 30 salad blends to satisfy every palate. If you're looking for the ultimate in convenience, try Dole's unique salad kit combinations that include farm-fresh lettuces and vegetables, mouth-watering all-natural toppings, and specially made dressings. It's all you need to make a distinctively delicious salad. The possibilities are endless. Visit www.dolesalads.com for recipes and other ideas to feed your culinary imagination. Big data is being generated by everything around us all the time. Every digital process and social media exchange produce it. Systems, sensors, and mobile devices transmit it. Big data is arriving from multiple sources with ever-increasing velocity, volume, and variety. It's becoming the world's newest resource for competitive advantage, allowing decision-making to move from the elite few to the empowered many. The escalating demand for insights requires a fundamentally new approach to architecture, tools, and practices. To extract meaningful value from big data, you need optimal processing power, analytics capabilities, and skills. Find out how IBM Big Data and Analytics can transform your business. Visit www.ibm.com slash bigdata today. That's www.ibm.com slash big data. Hello, my name is Jackie Tucker. I am owner of a home care agency called Care from the Heart in Home Service. We are honored to provide a variety of caregiving services from homemade chicken soup to hands-on care and to continue to encourage you and support you to be independent. We specialize in dementia care and end of life. Our team of care providers are supervised by our case managers who are also registered nurses. Our care providers are certified nursing assistants and to further 
further develop their knowledge and caregiving skills, they are taught by our nursing instructor, Barbara Mayoshi. She's a very important member of our healthcare team. Barbara has been teaching in Santa Cruz County for eight years. Hello, I'm Barbara Mayoshi. I'm an LVN licensed vocational nurse and instructor. I have been on the Care from the Heart healthcare team for a year now, providing the wonderful employees of Care from the Heart with their monthly in services. I teach continuing ed classes to increase their knowledge and skill set. Teaching Care from the Heart caregivers has been delightful. They are kind, caring, and very respectful. Care from the Heart is here to serve you with dignity and respect. Our telephone number is area code 831 876-8316. Again, the number is 831-476-8316. Our doors are opened 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Please call Care from the Heart. Hi, this is Dr. David Biles. I want to thank the listeners of the Perspective Radio Show for keeping Santa Cruz County fluoride-free and spreading the word on Agenda 21, chemtrails, geoengineering, the hazards of flu shots, vaccines, and the benefits of oil pulling and biological dentistry. Listen to me, Dr. David Biles, and the other Perspective host, Tom Quinn, as we air the most influential hour on KSCO, noon to one, every Saturday, 1080 AM, 104.1 FM, and KSCO.com. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is Tim Pawlenty. Now, we've touched on the plight of retirees who don't have enough savings to retire, as well as the growing danger of cyber terrorism today, uh, two issues which haven't been given enough attention by the current contenders for the presidency on either side of the aisle. So let me ask you, what else would you like to see the candidates address as we enter home stretch? I think that, you know, the two big themes that most Americans care about, uh, Rebecca, are one, keep us safe, and two, uh, take care of my pocketbook. In other words, you know, for most Americans, look, the the main way that they're going to have a decent standard of living and a decent quality of life is to have access to a good paying job. There's a lot that goes into that, creating the environment where jobs like that are growing and available, and also making sure people are prepared for the skills and abilities they need to be qualified for and to, to keep a job like that. So, you know, to just kind of simplify it down to its base elements, keep us safe and make sure my job is, is secure and, and uh, or I've got other job opportunities. Uh, there's a lot of other issues that come up. You know, we talked about some of them in healthcare and cyber and infrastructure and so many more, but, you know, those are the two. So I would, I would like to see, in addition to the focus on, understandable focus on terrorism and security, you know, what, is, what are these candidates going to do specifically to fix the spending binge and the deficit and the debt? We talked about it earlier, but, you know, the truth of the matter is they're going to have to tackle entitlements. They're going to have to say what they're, they're going to do specifically. And then they're going to have to rally the country to get them to be able to say it's OK politically to pass some of those changes. And and we're just not hearing that, frankly. People are ducking and bobbing and delaying. But uh, the, the, you know, the payment's going to come due in the not-too-distant future. Well, they're going to have to lay out some specifics in the next 10 months. You can't rely on slogans for 10 yeah. more months, can you? No, that's right. And it's pretty clear. <laughs> I mean, let's be candid. Donald Trump's got uh, his appeal, but putting specifics out there isn't one of them. Um, you know, he's kind of a thematic level person, and he hasn't really talked about what he'd do with entitlements uh, in any any detail. And a couple of the other front runners have been not focused on it either. So I'd like to see more of that to answer your question. You know, last week there was a poll that came out that showed Trump had hit 40 percent. Uh, so, you know, as a, as a former chairperson of McCain and Romney's campaigns, what what are the other candidates learning from Trump's success? I think in these times, pretty uncertain times from a security standpoint and the economy, you know, people, the, the message from Trump in part is they want strong leaders. They want people who are declarative. They want people who they get a sense of, you know, it's not one of them and not one of the, you know, insider group. But they also want somebody with strong leadership convictions and strong leadership skills and abilities. And there's a lot of people, I think, that say, look, I don't agree with everything Trump is saying, but 
he's he's unlike all these other politicians that we don't like. He speaks differently. He talks differently. And even though he's a billionaire from New York and you know came from a family with money, he sounds like a populist. And I think people are kind of in a populist mood. And believe it or not, a a New York billionaire has kind of taken up a lot of the populist space in the race. This has got to shock you because you call yourself a practical, down to earth Sam's Club Republican. And, uh, and you know, people relate to you. They relate to your background. They relate to the fact that you earned your way uh, into that governor uh, position. And then all of a sudden now we've got a billionaire running for president who no one should be able to relate to. <laughs> it's got to be yeah. shocking. <laughs> no, well, I actually predict, I don't, you won't believe this, but some years ago I was on a blog and I said somebody like Donald Trump could be the nominee because what we're seeing is – Um, a convergence of news and entertainment and politics. And so, you know, it's almost becoming like a cartoon. You have to not only be a leader and be knowledgeable on the issues, but, but the expectation, the attention spans are shorter. The traditional news outlets have given way to sort of infotainment outlets. So it's, it's not just news, it's entertainment. And people sort of look at the candidates and they say not only who's knowledgeable or who's skilled, but do they entertain me? Do they inspire me? And uh, do they make me laugh? You know, do they look good and sound good on television? So there's an entertainment quality to it that Trump combines with sort of a rebellion, populist tone and qualities that I think is, you know, putting him in the position he's in. So it's drifting more and more away from you know, who's a technocrat or who's actually skilled in terms of their resume or, or experience in terms of their resume to, you know, who entertains me and who inspires me. And while to be a leader, you got to be inspiring. We can't just have it all be charisma and inspiration. There has to be some depth and substance to it, too. Well, and, and also you've got to be able to win a national election. I mean, it's not it's not just the GOP nomination. In order to win a national election, you have got to appeal to women Blacks, Hispanics, independents, and you got to get some Democrats. I, yeah. I don't, I don't know how that happens with Trump. He's managed to alienate everybody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's he's also put his finger on something. We have to be fair and say, look, he's put his finger on something, which is, I think, there's a the undercurrent or the subline is people saying these regular politicians have screwed things up so bad. That how how much worse could it be if somebody like Trump, who's shall we say unorthodox politically, uh, gets in there? And there's sort of uh, how much worse could it be? <laughs> well, I I hate to think we're going to cast our votes on that basis, but you may well be right. Look, I know there are a lot of listeners today who are wondering whether you're going to return to your work in government. And so, without divul- divulging any secrets, can you tell us if you have any plans? <laughs> You know, I don't, Rebecca, I consider myself politically retired. Uh, As you mentioned at the top of the show, I served in a city council level, a state legislator level, a majority leader, and two terms as governor, and briefly but very unsuccessfully ran for president. So I had a full run at it, and I'm enjoying my time, you know, dealing with business and private sector issues. Um, So I don't have any plans to return. Well, I can't say that I blame you, but I know there are a lot of Minnesotans who would like to see you back around now. Well, you're nice to say. I appreciate that. I, it's meaningful. I enjoy public service a great deal. You get up every day, to, you learn things, and you have a chance to, to use your time and talents to do something hopefully meaningful and for the common good. Um, but in Minnesota, keep in mind, I'm a Republican, and that's a pretty blue or Democratic place, so it's not exactly a walk in the park to get elected there as a Republican. Absolutely. But with your track record there uh, and the condition the state's in right now, I have to believe there are a lot of people uh, thinking about the good old days when Palenti was at the at the helm. Now, for folks who want to know more about your activities, your opinions, and get information about your book, The Courage to Stand, do you have a website or a social media address they can go to? Sure. You know, the easiest way, I, of course, I've got a Facebook page, but the easiest way to do that is at Tim Palenti on Twitter. And uh, the one thing I mentioned at the top of the show, if mm-hmm. you're interested in kind of pressuring your company to get into better savings for their employees. Yes. Safe 10 is a, is a branding name for an initiative. We've got a campaign to try to get more companies doing more for their employees. So it's save10.org. 
Save10.org. I'd like listeners to go there, particularly now that we know that most retirees, which is a third of the country, do not have a retirement plan. So go to Save10. It's not too late. You can do something about that today. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we've got left. But before we close today's program, I do want to take a moment to thank you for your service to our country. Thank you, Mr. Palenti. You're kind to say. It's been my pleasure, and, and I hope everybody has a wonderful Christmas and holiday season. Absolutely, and same to you and your family. Look forward to speaking to you again. Okay, thanks a lot. And that is all the time that we have this hour. If you have a question or a comment to make about our interview with Tim Palenti today, you can contact me on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and also by using our contact page on our website at RebeccaCosta.com. We love to hear from you, and we make a point to answer every one of your emails. So while you're at our website... Uh, you know, be sure that you go to the contact page and you get and you and you give us uh, your email address, and uh, we'll contact you right back. And also, let me remind you that one of the most unique and appreciated gifts you can give this season is a first edition book with a custom dedication and autograph to the one you love. So, if you have a reader on your list or someone who likes to stay current on politics and social trends, make sure you put in your order for your copy of The Watchman's Rattle early. Just click on the book and it'll take you to the order form and it only takes a few brief minutes to fill in the form with the dedication you want and then in a few days presto the book arrives and there's one less gift you have to stand in long lines at the mall to purchase so this year make your holiday shopping a little easier and order your copies of the nonfiction book that has stayed in the top one percent of amazon's nonfiction list for five years running it's destined to become a classic Next week, I'll be spending time with my family, and so we'll be re-airing our interview with the man who has moderated more presidential debates than any other living individual, Mr. Jim Lair. He gives us some unique insights into what goes on behind the scenes of these debates. So join us as we rebroadcast our landmark interview with the Dean of Moderators, Jim Lair. Next week on the only program that puts policy ahead of politics. Now stay tuned for a second hour of Straight Talk Radio. You're listening to the Costa Report. Now, if you've been listening to the Costa Report, you know that I'm a big fan of wines by Caraccioli Cellars. And today I'm here with Scott Caraccioli, who's one of the brains behind the most memorable wines money can buy. So I have a question for you. How did your family get into the wine business? Um, You know, in 